happen in organic materials. So, so now in OPVs, you know, we're interested in all photovoltaics. We're going to suck the charge out of the cells. So we're going to send some light in. We're going to generate some charge uh, in a material maybe like this, and I'm going to pull it out. Right. So just a quick reminder to then talk about uh, OPV. Uh, last time, if you look in a device, if you have a simplistic model uh, where you know some people argue this is right, but you know, as far as I can tell, this this data fairly well for, for most things. If you imagine there's a dark diode and a current generator, if you run your OPV in the dark, you'll see kind of reasonable diode behavior if things are going well. That's charge injection from one side and the other, uh, and then they recombine at some, some time constant time. Okay? Now, if I operate over here, I turn the light on, I'll have some photocurrent, it'll, it'll go the opposite way. There's some recombination process that may or may not be the same as up here. Uh, and what you find is they get sucked out through the electrodes in an electric field. So it's a competition between how fast they can get out versus how fast they tend to recombine. And then as you move along the curve here, you'll get to some point where the light current and the dark current are the same. And the composite of that gives you your, your open circuit voltage and the red curve is, is what you'd observe in the light. Okay. So that's kind of simplistically what's happening. So when I'm out here, I have in, you know, when people argue about this, so I'll assume that I have a, the electric field drops across the sample, and we're just going to drift the charges out. Okay. So that's, I think, the, you know, when you start, it's a good place to start, and you add complexity from there. So what you find is, if you think about this, if I want to treat this bulk header junction, I just mix those two things together, as we've heard. And we have, you know, let's say we have P3HT, there's a difference between uh, the HOMO and, and, and the LUMO. Uh, and, and what we see here is a LUMO and the HOMO over here, for example. Uh, and if I take PCBM, and I say in an isolated case, I have uh, a HOMO and a LUMO for that one. Uh, if I'm lucky, you know, I can pretend, as we heard yesterday, that effectively the charge carriers will just find uh, the state here, the LUMO here, will drop uh, in, in energy to the, the LUMO of PCBM. Uh, the whole will go uphill, they'll go to the HOMO of, of the, uh, the P3HT. And I have kind of an effective uh, band gap that's a composite of, of those two uh, materials. Okay? Now, when I look at this, if I measure these two materials separately, or and I measure that what it looks like in the blend, you don't necessarily get uh, the over, you know, perfect overlap of the two. There may be offsets between these levels. If you mix them together, they're not in the same environment anymore. There's some discussion about it in this paper, which I, which I think is nice. There's some nice values that actually put some numbers on what, what, these, how much, what these shifts might, might be. But typically, it's something, you know, the effective gap in P3HT, you know, it's going to be something like a, you know, a volt and a, almost not quite a volt and a half, something between a volt. Uh, now, the thing to remember is you can do those time of flight experiments I talked about before, which were for a material that was pure, so just one material. Uh, and you ask the question, if I did the time of flight on those two uh, materials, you might expect, can I say that that's the whole mobility in, in blend? Well, no, uh, unfortunately. So here's a classic example, it's sort of an odd data that, that people, I think, still, there's some arguments about why this happens, but a uh, number of groups have seen it. You mix a material like PPV and fullerene, and you do a time of flight experiment, uh, what you find is that the whole ability of the PPV actually uh, increases as you throw more fullerene in the, in the uh, blend. Uh, the fullerene mobility you know, moves around it as well. And so what you find is that you know, the transport that you pull out of the blend is not necessarily the same uh, as that of, of the material on its own. And so one of the things you can do if you want to see if these effects are going on, is that you can measure the transport of these things independently. If you have a new material, you can mix them together and see what you get, and try to make some sense out of what's going on. Okay? And there's some arguments about fullerene and how it might affect the packing of the chains, uh, but I don't, I don't think anything's written in stone yet about why that happens. You can make it another argument that the dielectric constant goes up again, fullerene in. Um, so it's quite interesting, right? So because of this order in these systems, there are a lot of possible explanations, and in many cases, it's difficult to assign a particular change just to one thing. Now, when I think about this, uh, and somebody may want to dim the lights and think it's like, I can see this. This is, this is my black period, as you heard yesterday. My dark background. Okay, so just to remind you, here's my bulk header junction. Here's one of some fullerenes, and here's some polymer. And you know, the material's in the ground state, and here's, I'm going to plot free energy this way. And so if I send in a photon, I create an excited state. It could have been in the donor, it could have been in the acceptor. 
I picked donor here just at a convention, but you know you could equally have put the energy uh, into the acceptor. Nonetheless, it doesn't matter. This is how much energy you have. This is you want to put in maybe a, a green photon or a red photon. Uh, you know, it'll change how much energy I, I put in the system. Okay, and so now that excited state maybe it walks around and eventually gets to an interface. And the interface could be molecular. It could be a polymer sitting next to a fullerene that's isolated. It could be a domain where there's an aggregated fullerene and an aggregated polymer. And then something happens. It generates charge. Okay, and I'm not the person to argue about this, but you can imagine uh, you people argue whether or not if the uh, excitation is very close, you expect there's some quantum mechanical coupling between the electron on the fullerene and the positive charge on the donor. Uh, you'd expect that there will be a, you can try to calculate the quantum mechanics here. You can call it charge transfer state at that interface. Okay, and that has some energy. You don't know exactly where that is. Maybe it's here, maybe it's here. Uh, if you uh, just turn off your, your quantum mechanics brain and, and you say to yourself, you know, I have electrostatic attraction between these two. At some point, these two things will move away from each other. The wave functions won't touch. Uh, and you can pretend that the electrostatics is fine in some sort of effective dielectric constant. They're still attracted to each other. Maybe that's a couple of nanometers apart. Uh, in electric field uh, that I'm going to put on this, uh, and uh, the fact that I have a dilute amount of charge, you know, it's downhill. Uh, to move away. There's only one way to have the charges close together. There are a lot of ways to have them apart, so you get a little boost uh, from that. Uh, maybe you have an electric field in the device, which tends to push, allow the charges to drift away. Uh, and what happens is this is distance here. And eventually you get to free carriers. Maybe they're far away, so greater than 10 nanometers. So they still see each other, but you're really starting to, to, to they're not seeing each other quite as much. Uh, eventually you're far away from each other. You get to the limit where they don't see each other and the energy of the separated plus uh, donor and the negatively charged acceptor is basically equal to the ionization energy in the uh, electron affinity. So this is kind of the homo-lumo difference out here. Okay? And so what it says is this is how much energy I had to start with. If I want to pull them out of the cell, I need pretty much I need at least this energy. And there may be other loss processes, so by the time you get them out, you may lose a little bit more energy, but this is the minimum amount that you, you, you have to have. Okay, or maximum amount, sorry, that, that you have to have. You, you can only, you can't get more energy out than, than this energy, okay? And so there's a loss there between here and here, okay? And each material has a different amount of loss between the photon you put in and the energy that, that you get out. That depends on the offset of the energy levels and the disorder, okay? So the thing to remember, just burn in your head, that's, you know, think about it. I have this much energy in, and this is how much energy I might be able to get out. Okay. So, how do you know what these energies might be? Well, you know, there's an interesting thing in organic materials. You can do UV vis spectroscopy, which we all do. And if plot on a log scale, you might be able to go down a couple orders of magnitude to get a good spectrometer, maybe a little better, depending on how skilled you think you are. And what you see is if you look at P3HT uh, and PCBM by themselves and bulk header junction, you kind of see different levels. I mean, I, I, I didn't write down uh, what Ludwig put as the thicknesses here. Uh, but what you find is you know you, you, you kind of cut out there. That's where your instrument stops. Okay. So you might imagine if I go down to energy, is there anything left? And, and you know the answer should be sure there is because I whited out this plot. It's very obvious. You know, if you were to publish something where you, you put it on an axis like this. Uh, and you might ask the question, how could I measure lower than this? And so there are specialized techniques to do this. One of them, a uh, classic one, is something called photothermal deflection spectroscopy. Not many people have one of these. Uh, I don't. Um, so, and what you have is uh, basically you can do something where you basically have a pump uh, energy. Okay, so you may you change your spectral energy here, and if your sample absorbs that light, it generates a little bit of heat. If you put your sample in a fluid. Uh, if the fluid changes temperature a bit, the refractive index changes. And you can actually look at the deflection of a probe uh, laser, say a red laser, it doesn't matter what light that is, uh, because of that small change in refractive index. And when you do that, you can keep going down many orders of magnitude. Okay? And so it's very sensitive. Okay? This is used, they've been used for organics uh, and used for inorganic materials. It's sort of a classic way to look at what's called the band tail of absorption. And what you see is, these are the curves for P3HT and PCBM, and they drop off uh, you know, relatively steeply. Uh, and then there's some, some uh, resonances here to, that, are, that are seen in a variety of materials. So if you're interested in telecommunications, you worry about this stuff. Uh, these are overtones of certain things. Uh, but what you see in the bulk header junction is suddenly you see this tail here that's very different from the two isolated materials. 
So there's a bunch of states here that can absorb light that are mu uh, because you mix the two things together. Okay. And so this was a specialized technique. Okay. That many of us don't have. What technique do a lot of us have? Well, if you look at external quantum efficiency of a of a material, so people typically plot on a linear scale. This is wavelength. And here's P3HT, PCBM, sort of an OK cell, the EQE is 0.6. Uh, if you look, EQE is basically electrons collected versus number of photons uh, incident. So it tells you how efficiently. So that means I'm for the, you know, every photon I illuminate, I get 0.6 uh, carriers out. And you, know, you say, well, the optical gap of P3HT, PCBM is, is here. And this is pretty similar to the optical gap of P3HT if you measure by itself. And you say this spectrum you know, has some wiggles in it depending on the thin film optics, and, but it looks more or less like the absorption spectrum now of the two materials together. Now, if you just take that data and you run out to here, which many of us do, and you actually plot it on a log scale uh, over here, uh, what you see is here's the absorption edge, and suddenly there are a bunch of features out here. Suddenly, you're uh, like, wow, I'm generating charge. I'm not very good at it, I'm not generating very much. Uh, but you know, there's a lot of states out here that if you put energy in, you get charge out. And this will keep going uh, until you hit that uh, the maximum energy uh, that, that, you, that it takes to, to get this, the, uh, that's, the op that's the gap, right? So it turns out that if you have a photon that's below the energy of the separate electron hole pairs, you, can, you shouldn't be able to get anything out. So if you just keep going, eventually this will flatten out and you won't get any charge out. You may run out of sensitivity there. You have to do this with a lock-in amplifier. You can go down a couple orders of magnitude more than this, as we'll see. Uh, and so there's the optical gap there. So these are subgap states. This is not just P3HT and PCBM. There's a lot of people doing this now. If you look at the, the linear absorption, here's the solar spectrum. Uh, just for reference, this is a nice, nice paper where what you actually see is a bunch of different polymers, low band gap, uh, you know, P3HT that everyone likes to look at. And what you see is typically you'll see different kind of slopes and different changes. And maybe you'll see like a little peak there. Uh, and people will now argue about what that's due to. Uh, I'm not going to argue about spectroscopy today. Maybe Gary can argue about that. Uh, so what, what you'll find is sometimes you'll see a little resonance there in what we we'll call a charge transfer state. If you actually run this device like a, uh, a light emitting diode, you can see luminescence from these states in some cases. So you can try to assign what this stuff is, is actually is chemically. It's quite interesting. So, you know, nonetheless, there are always some states down there. Now, if you look, you know, how does that, what does that do to? Well, it's something that comes up in the material uh, due to disorder and, and the coupling of the two things. So most people look at that to polymers and uh, uh, fullerene. You can look at small molecules, like these are two examples. These are from Guy Bazan's group that we've looked at. If you look at the diffraction pattern, you know, this one is not, the silicon bridge compound is, is not quite as ordered uh, as this carbon bridge compound. And you see here's the fullerene ring. Uh, what you find is if you look at that subgap region, uh, these are lower band gap materials, but what you find is generally if you plot a bunch of different polymers on these, the tail's actually steeper uh, for these molecular materials than, than, the, uh, than the polymers, okay? We don't know why that's true yet. You know, maybe it's that these are more ordered, maybe this, this should be characteristic of, of what the defects are in the sample. This is all new stuff, so we don't really know what, what's there. There's not a whole lot of data published that we've been able to to, but here's some sense perhaps that small molecules might be a bit different than the polymers just because of the, the nature of the ordering. So this is sort of a, I call like a frontier thing, to try to figure out what this stuff is down here. What is it that's generating charge below the apparent absorption of the material? Okay. And it may be different depending on each material you look at. It's easy to measure. Okay, so everybody, if you have a lock-in and an EQB setup, just, just let it run out and block the data. Now, if you, another way to look at these uh, states or what's happening, you know, what are, what are the, uh, so those are optical excitations, right? So that's a way to generate the charge. What happens after you generate the charge? Well, that's something that we work on a bit. So there are a variety of ways to look at what happens once you have that charge, okay? So we can argue about how they get made, but once they're made, they'll, they'll move around in the material. So there are a variety of techniques, transient techniques, where you look at electrical measurements. And these are not the photophysical techniques with femtosecond lasers. These are things where you do things like uh, pulse the light for charge extraction and transient photoconductivity, where you pulse the light, let the light shut off, and actually watch the carrier suck out of the device. Uh, there are a variety of uh, measurements like this. There's one transient photovoltage where you measure the voltage as you pulse a little extra light in your open circuit. Uh, there's another measurement a lot of people like called charge extraction and linearly increasing voltage cella, uh, where you use the ramps versus this one, which will use kind of the square pulses. 
Uh, everyone has their favorite method that they use. I'm only going to talk about this one because it's simple uh, conceptually and it's most similar to the time of play. Uh, so if we ask a question, someone asked a question before, you know, what's the Fermi level or how do I think about that? Uh, so if you don't think about Fermi levels, you know, you can just think about how much charge do I ever have in a device. Okay. So you can estimate the number of carriers if you want. So if you said the steady state hole concentration, it's going to be something like the generation rate times the, the lifetime. Okay, this is always true. So the generation rate is just set by how much light you put in versus the quantum efficiency of generating charge. So you could just assume it's one, just for fun, and say at, at one sign you're illuminating something like you know almost 10 to the 17 photons per second per centimeter square. I did the math right. Uh, in a volume of a, a 100 nanometer thick cell, roughly, that means you're going to get 6 times 10 to the 21 photons somewhere in that volume. Maybe it's not uniform, but that's, that's about how many photons you have. Uh, if they all get converted to charge, that's how many charges you're going to get. The lifetime of the charges, you know, it depends on how fast they get sucked out. Um, that depends on what you think the mobility is for the sample. You know, if you use 10 to the minus 3 and you use kind of a voltage somewhere along this curve, it doesn't matter so much. Very, these numbers, this is a rough estimate. Uh, you say, well, it takes about you know tenth of a microsecond to suck the charge out, roughly. Uh, and you know you end up with a number that you get something like 10 to the 15. You know, it depends on the illumination and what you think the mobility is. It could, this number could go up a little bit, uh, but it's you know something like 10 to the 15, 10 to the 16 charges per centimeter cube. Okay. So is that a lot, right? So who remembers uh, how many charges we thought total were in? In a device. So if I have 10 to the 15 or 10 to the 16 per, uh, centimeter cube charges, uh, how many carriers? Is that one carrier for every molecule in the cell? Is it one for 100, or is it one versus about 10 to the 6 molecules? If I, if I say I have you know discrete units or monomers in the polymer or, or isolated molecules, okay. So so who thinks it's a? Okay. Now when you see cartoons, you may think it's this number. People sometimes draw like this. Who thinks it's one and out of 100? Good. So, you know, it's more like this number, right? So the way to think about this, it's pretty dilute, right? You know, the mobile stuff, right? Is it, you're in the Olympic Stadium. This is 80,000 people, roughly. So if there's you, the probability you're going to see another carrier to see your friend is, is low if you walk in and hear at random, okay? So that means the carriers are very dilute, typically, in solar cells, much more dilute than in transistors. Okay? And you can argue a bit about the exact number and what you think is trapped and what the transit time is. But no matter what comes out, it's pretty dilute. Okay, so if I said to myself, if I do the, something like a time of flight experiment, although in this case we'll call it transient photoconductivity, the charge extraction, I take my solar cell and I have a bias on it, I have a resistor, same as before, I'm going to measure a voltage at that resistor. If I send in a light pulse, I send in a pulse of light, I turn the light pulse off, and I just measure the current that flows, and it's just going to decay. Okay, now during the decay, the hole in the electron could recombine. You know, this is thin, right? This is unlike the time of flight. You're, you're not worried, you know, you apply some voltage and maybe you'll send in some dilute charge to try to not perturb the voltage if you apply a bias. Sometimes you might try to run this at high voltage and you know, argue about the numbers. We'll, we'll almost see show data where it's dilute in this case, or low light. Uh, the current will decay, much like a time of flight signal. Okay. Uh, now, what are you probing, right? So you could have recombination during this. There are a lot of mechanisms for recombination. Uh, you can either have geminate recombination, that is, if I generate a hole in an electron, they just stay close to each other and they never get apart and just recombine. Okay? That means the charges are generated from the same photon. You can have bimolecular, I'll classify this as bimolecular in the sense that they're not from the same photon, that this hole of this electron came from somewhere else at random. And they just found each other at an interface or a molecular state, a, a trap, or, or whatever you'd like to call it at some point. And you can argue about different mechanisms here and, and the rate constants for these things depending on whether you think they're trapped or they're mobile. Uh, but nonetheless, the idea of bimolecular meaning I have a whole electron that didn't that weren't from the same photon. I'm going to classify it well that way. Okay. So charge extraction isn't going to tell you a whole lot about this. It'll tell you maybe you could argue it'll tell you a little bit about this. But it mostly tells you about processes like this where the charges are away from each other and they come together. Okay. I would say this is a dominant thing that may impact your measurement. Okay. So what do you get in practice, right? So let's look at two cells, okay? So I'll look at P3HT uh, versus this, this other material, the PBDTTPD. This is a material uh, from Boucher's group. What's nice about these materials 
is that the optical gap of this material and this material are pretty close. They're about the same. They both work with C60 fullerene, uh, but this one has a deeper uh, homo level. Uh, and what it does is you can take a, a this is data for like, you get 4.5% P3HD cell. You can make this one 6.5. The fill factors are both about the same. This material is better because I shoved out the, the open circuit voltage. Okay. So these are both have about the same short circuit current. Uh, because the optical gap is about the same for these two materials. Okay, one, this one maybe a little should be a tiny bit better, but it's the closest thing we could find. That should be, you know, kind of a toy model to say, well, what is my optical gap? We're about the same. You know, make sure the short circuit current and the same illumination should be about the same. Let's see how these two materials behave differently. Okay, if we use the same acceptor. Um, the main difference is look that one has a deeper homo, it's 5.6. This one's about. You, know, you can argue where these are but relative to each other. It's about half. Of you could argue that P3HD, in some cases, if you do UPS, you could say it's 4.8 or something. But nonetheless, the difference, it's a difference between these two things that matter when the absolute value. These are, these are from ECAM done by Riker Shea's group. So that it depends on the reference electrode where you press what this actually is, you assign it to be. So what you find is if I take a cell of the, of the Brechet material, and I just look at the charge that leaps out of the device after a light pulse and low intensity, okay? So this is something like, uh, you know, you know, less than one, much less than one sun, maybe a hundredth of a sun illumination. What you see is that their charges that come out kind of fast, right? So this looks like a kind of a decay that you might imagine seeing in a time of flight curve. There's a, some of them come out fast. This is basically the RC time constant because the device is thin. Uh, and, but then at long time, suddenly it kind of plateaus a bit. It takes a long time for some charges to get out way over here, right? And so you can think about this in a model like this where some of the charges are trapped and they get to some mobile states and, and they find their way out. Okay. And basically as I move this way, you can imagine that there's an attempt frequency or a certain amount of time of prefactor that sets how often they might try to escape and a probability that they're going to get out depending on the depth, how deep they are relative to the thermal energy. And so as I move out in time here, I'm increasing the energetic depth of the states. So the idea is we're going to assume that when we're out here, uh, if I detract, I'm going to make it to the electrode very quickly, and I'm not going to detract on the way out. Or I'm not going to trap again on, on the way out. Okay? And if you look, this time scale is really long, right? This is, this is you know, a lot of milliseconds, okay? So I turn the light off, uh, and, and there's still charge coming out of the device you know, a long time later. Not much charge, okay? This is very low. This is not a whole, if you integrate this, this is not a whole lot of charge. Uh, you know, another way to look at this, if you don't want to set up that transient measurement, uh, you can actually do this quite easily with a function generator and some LEDs. If you don't have a laser, do something equivalent. So there's kind of a neat measurement you can do that uh, we've done, and Chris McNeil uh, and you know, Greenham have worked on as well, and probably a bunch of others that I, I haven't looked up. Uh, what, what you find is basically if you could pulse the light for a certain amount of time and watch the current while the light's on. Okay, so this is going to be high illumination. This is, you can do this at one sign or less. Uh, and you can set a delay time in between another pulse that comes up. So this isn't cell lab or anything. I'm not doing anything that complicated. This is as if I took the cell and put on their solar illuminator, and I just waited for a while. I'm just using LEDs so I can turn them off. And I wait a while, and I turn it off, and the current will leak out. And I wait a little while, and then turn the light back on to see what happens. Okay? And I just look at what that signal looks like. You can do this very simply, very easy to set up. LEDs are cheap. Most people have an oscilloscope. And LED is a uh, current generator. Or, or basically something to generate enough uh, current to, to turn these on, depending on the illumination you need. The other thing you can do is you can put a background light on as well. So you can do this, you can set it to be one sun and basically pulse just a little bit of, of light in as well. Now, if you do that, what you see is something funny, right? So there are a lot of explanations for this. And, and I'll tell you the one that we think is going on here. And if one, someone wants to argue after, we can argue after. Uh, if you look at this, basically this is a small number. This is 11 uh, milliamps per centimeter square. If you turn the light on, you pulse it on, suddenly you get this overshoot, right? You get, this is roughly the steady state current you measure in a JV curve. But somehow you pulse the light on, and in sort of the, the microsecond time scale, suddenly you get this extra charge or extra current. It kind of decays down. And if you keep waiting, it stays stable at this. And depending on how long you wait between uh, when you turn the device on or off, what you see is that that, that pulse changes, okay? So what it means is, when I'm populating this effective density of states of these two materials, uh, basically I, I'm filling these, these, these tail states of the material, 
And as we see, as we move uh, at time, if I go back here, I knew there were some charges that took a long time to get out. And so if I increase the delay between these, I'm going to let the charges have more time to escape. Okay? And if I do that, I get a lot of this extra current. If I don't let them have much time to escape, that current is lower. And so what that means is we believe that what this, this signal means, and there are other things it could mean, is that this is roughly this time, is roughly the time it takes to reach sort of some sort of steady state, meaning the charges are finding all those traps and getting stuck. You can increase the background light, okay, and you say, well, what if I just fill those up ahead of time? Okay, and if I have a background illumination, that curve also goes down. So it's like those states are getting filled up just by increasing the background illumination. Okay. Now, what you see is if you compare that curve uh, to the transient photoconductivity, so this is highlight, so this is basically at near one sun, you, you, and you can transform this data and map it onto that transient photoconductivity, the decay should have looked like this. Okay. This is a case where all, those, all of the uh, states were filled up, and you don't see this little hump anymore. Now, you could go ahead and say go back and then do the transient experiment where what you do is you have that light pulse from the laser, but then you just leave a little bit of background illumination there and you see exactly the same result. So if you watch the current leak out uh, over time versus if you have an optical bias, which is always generating some extra charge in there. Uh, what you see is a transient, it's hard to see here, it actually moves down to here and actually comes out what you'd expect from an extrapolation from up here. And what that's telling you or a, an explanation that we like is that these are deep trap states that basically are being filled and they're always satisfied with the background light. Okay? And it's very convenient. You can take the low tech measurement with the pulse, with the pulse generator and the oscilloscope with LEDs, or you can use a laser experiment and you get the same result. It's very consistent. Now, you might ask, what if I use a different material? So I have these two materials with the same fill factor at one sun. Do you get the same transient? Well, this is quite interesting, right? So it turns out P3 actually doesn't have any of those deep states in our hands. Okay, we don't see that, it just decays off. So this looks like the, the, uh, the case where I had the background light for, for the, the PDD, TPD3, okay? So you see those deep states here and none here, okay? So why is that? Well, if you look, there's no deep states. We think there's no deep states for P3HT. It's possible there just aren't any, okay? But that's probably unlikely, right? I and mean, all these materials are disordered. Uh, if you look around, most of them have similar tails in the uh, EQE spectrum. So you'd expect there, there ought to be some deep states here. Uh, another possibility that we should prefer is that if you have lightly doped P3HT, uh, the charge concentration that we're using here is something like 10 to the 15. If you calculate what you think the background doping is for P3HT, it's easily that much. Okay. Now, P3HT is a higher line HOMO level than this material, so this is a deeper HOMO device. We know a lot of things from the transistor world that if you have the materials like this tend to dope on their own uh, if you expose them to ambient or, uh, and, or if you measure a sample, they have a little higher background conductivity than materials that have a much uh, a deeper line homo. Okay? These are, for some reason, they don't dope as much uh, advantageously. These, these are the impurities that are in it. You don't know what they are. But generally, if you take a, a low, uh, low line homo, it's going to be less conductive on its own. So we expect that this behavior, we might expect to see this uh, if you look at materials that have lower line uh, homo levels than, than you do over here. Okay. Uh, now, what else could you do, right? So, if you do this transient, you know, it kind of looks like the time of light curve, okay? Now, in the inorganic semiconductor world, people have figured out ways to kind of take this data where you have time and current and transform it. So, we think that if you believe as a charge is escape in the dark, that it's related to the release time of the carriers, what that says is the release time distribution is related to the distribution of, you know, at, at a particular time, you're going to look at a particular trap depth, okay, due to the thermal energy. You can take the photocurrent here and basically write an expression that the photocurrent is related to the density of trap states with some factors, and it's related to the change uh, in the uh, number of traps energies versus time. And what you can do is you can transform the data and actually back out the density of states uh, as a function of energy from the photocurrent. Okay? You can see some discussion of this with some nice references in this paper uh, by Bob Street, where he pulls out something like an effective composite density of states to the materials. It's sort of like the density of the trap states. Uh, it's hard to know exactly what that's due to, right? They could be electrons or holes, depending on where you're at on this curve. You can imagine the holes get sucked out or the electrons. The mobility is different. Okay? So 
this is, you know, this is the thing. This is the state of the art. This is people are making, measuring this sort of data and trying to understand what the electronic structure is using different models. Okay, this is one model to take a look at. Uh, can you do better than that? Okay, well, you can add some, what I mean by better is can you add some complexity, right? That's a simple transform where you just assume the time to get out is related to trap state. We know from a lot of experiments, there are a lot of processes going on, okay? And so you can, this, this very uh, busy looking diagram is basically saying, if I had some density of states here and here for holes and electrons, and I have some tail states, uh, well, between them and the tail states, they, they touch each other, there's no reason they can't touch. Uh, sometimes you might hop to a, you might excite to a mobile state and, and move around, you might hop around in the band tail, you might recombine in the device, and, but these are the, the energetic states you have to, you know, you feel the, the play that the electrons in the holes are going to move around in. Uh, and so what you have to do, at this point, you know, the previous example, you could do a, an analytical expression, which is sort of nice, I, I like analytical expression. If you want to go past that, you always can add more complexity and more parameters, and it's force going to fit better. Right? It's always going to fit better if you add more parameters. Uh, but to do this, if you have an expression like this, you have to do numerical simulation. You have to solve the Poisson equation for the device to, to the extent you think you understand the compact. You have to put in a recombination mechanism. You take uh, Shockley-Reed-Hall recombination. Uh, and you basically can take a model like this and try to fit all the transient data, like the transient photoconductivity. You could try to fit the steady state JV curves. You can fit, uh, you know, the TPV data. Any data you have, okay, ought to fit self consistently. Okay. So what Rod McKenzie has done is he took all of our transient data for P3HG PCBM. He took this model and he let it refine. Okay. So now we have the case where we have our our, our goo, right, our polymer and our fullerene all mixed together. And when you let this refine, you know, a lot of people will say, well, here's my exponential density of states. But if you let this numerical model try to fit a very large data set, uh, and, and we, I was very picky about this. I told Rod and, and Chris Shuttle, who took this data, I said, I want you to leave out some of the data and predict it based on the model. Otherwise, I'm not going to believe that this has any bearing in reality. They did that, and it, and it works. And they did a number of things where, you know, it just, you, know you might ask, how unique is this fit? As far as we can tell, from the data set we had, it, it, it's relatively unique. Every time you can start the refinement of these parameters at different places, and it always comes back to, to this. And what you see is that you know, a lot of times you can pretend that the electron density of states looks like a simple exponential. As I said before, the holes are a simple exponential. But the model, if you believe to the extent one believes the parameters, there's all this structure in the density of states. Okay? There's structure in the electronic states, there's structure in the whole states. Okay? You might, you know, at, at this point, if you really believe this model, you might go looking for molecular origin in this. Because this actually looks like these are separated by something that's like a vibronic energy. It's quite interesting. Uh, and so this is really where things are at. There are a lot of people arguing about the most appropriate models to use, uh, including us. And what you really want to do if you're an experimentalist is take data like this. You took your experimental data, and there's all this morphological data, like x-ray and so forth. Try to connect these plots to this. And what I'll, I'll leave you with uh, is a reminder that all these models that we do sort of agree, or, or sort of have the same uh, feature, that they, they kind of pretend we're an effective semiconductor and, and we're sort of one-dimensional. There are a lot of people trying to fight this problem of multi-dimensional structure. I stole this, this uh, image uh, from a colleague and a, a very talented graduate student, this energy filter TEM. And this is actually energy filter TEM of a bulk Kenner junction, uh, low band gap material. And what you see is, I, you know, this is a fun movie to remember. So this is why you should always be skeptical of these 1D models. Here's what a bulk energy junction sort of looks like. Uh, some of these uh, regions actually are, uh, it's a particular cutoff where it thinks the uh, density of the fullerene is and where the polymer is. These images change a bit where you think the, the, the density is. But here I'm walking through my bulk energy junction. So you imagine you're a carrier, and this is what you see, right? You know, which is not quite 1D. These, and these uh, regions are probably blurred out. And this is what I'm trying to model, right? There are a lot of people trying to work on multi-scale models to try to incorporate morphology like this with the transport to go beyond 1D models. Uh, but again, we're adding a lot of parameters. And so when you work on this, this area, you have to be very skeptical and really step back and say, is everything consistent? And, and try to really understand what is this telling you about my material? I think we're at a very early stage now. And I, I think that people's analysis is getting better, the measurement techniques are getting better. 
And certainly, if you can now produce images like this with the right uh, electron microscope, there's some hope we might be able to pull out a lot more information about what's going on here. Uh, so I'll, I'll stop there. That's, that's my take on the extracting charge. So what you have to do, you know, if you, you have to make up an assumption that the, the whole the electron sit on sites is some sort of, you know, you can make a box and assign, you know, one box is fullerene and one box is a monomer. You have an effective size, uh, and then you make up a coupling between the sites, and then you arrange it in space to try to mimic this. Uh, the trouble is some of the Monte Carlo calculations when you do this kind of cut out, you can't make a box big enough to capture some of the detail here. So I think this is this is really the frontier thing. How to think about a good way to, to I, don't, I don't want to do horse grain, but sort of smear out you know, what level of complexity do you really need to fit fit these sorts of data? Do you really need to think about hopping site to site, or can you blur out the domain and, and kind of neglect some of the complexity within the domain and come up with kind of an effective uh, transport number for, for a domain? You know, some of this is mixed, right? So the electronic structure may not be uniform. So you're averaging over something, right? So the 1D models average, you know, if you think about it, some sort of weird average of this. Uh, the Monte Carlo will give you, you know, what you think a particular morphology will give, right? And so you have to, you know, people will look at different models. There's some work from a uh, Dutch group looking at, you know, different, you know, if you have finger domains or they have different pitches and all that. Uh, and I think there's some work there. There's a lot of work there. You know, this sort of thing, people try to model this cases, it's real hard because you don't know what parameters to put in. Uh, I, I, what I'll say is that a lot of the stuff, if you just measure the steady state curve, you know, that's not enough information to understand what's going on in this. I think everything we've done kind of says you, you have to, you, the best case is you would do steady state, you do steady state as a function of temperature, you have some transient measurements, you put all that together, you might have some hope because your model better predict all that data because you're, you know, you're putting, you're moving around the amount of charge, you change the temperatures. Each type of model has specific dependencies for these things. That's what you have to do. It's very hard. Okay, very hard. Thank you. It's worth trying, so don't be daunted by something being hard. Thank you all.